I'm going to go ahead and kick things off so you guys have full advantage of the full time for the session as we have a unique opportunity today to hear from Mary Holstedge, distinguished engineer at, at MarkLogic, um, to hear from her, to interact with her. She talks about search and the uh, MarkLogic data hub. So Mary. Uh, sound? How's my sound doing? All right. All right, let's go. <laughs> um, so today I'm going to talk about search and the MarkLogic Data Hub and how search drives a lot of the activity that's happening in the MarkLogic Data Hub. Uh, and to understand that, I'm going to sort of define an expansive view of the search perspective, the search way of solving problems. Uh, and then I'm going to flip the script a little bit and talk about what search gets from the Data Hub. And before we do that, I need to learn how to use a clicker. We need to talk about this. Where does innovation come from? What drives it? What demands it? What propels it? There's a lot of ways of answering this question, um, a lot of ways of framing the question. Uh, I'm going to pick one that comes from the mid-1800s. Uh, and it begins with a journey of discovery. Ooh, I'm getting echoed. Um, in 1854, uh, a young man set out on a journey of exploration and discovery uh, in search of gathering some evidence in support of a theory, a theory of innovation he was working on. Uh, his first expedition was a complete catastrophe. He was shipwrecked. He was left with literally the shirt on his back and a handful of notes. Uh, but this expedition uh, was a great success. He, he ventured out from England to far islands of the world, ended up bringing back 126,000 specimens. Although, let's be honest, most of them were beetles. Um, he gathered the data he needed. He wrote up his paper. It was presented to the Royal Society to great acclaim. He wrote a book. It was a bestseller. It's been in continuous print ever since. Uh, it's highly readable. I recommend it to you. And at this point, you're probably thinking, oh, she's talking about Charles Darwin and Origin of the Species. And you're so close, so very close. But no, this dude, this dude, uh, this is Alfred Russell Wallace, who is often called the co-discoverer of evolution by natural selection, along with Darwin. Uh, and the book is The Malay Archipelago. And I want to highlight Wallace as opposed to Darwin. Um, First of all, he's kind of an unsung hero of science, and I'm a sucker for that kind of thing. And he was the first biologist to take seriously the prospect of life on Mars, and I'm a sucker for that kind of thing. Uh, but Darwin focused on the struggle of the individual. Uh, Wallace focused on relationships, relationship to the landscape, and relationship to other creatures. And so the story of innovation, as Wallace would tell it, is something like this. Imagine. You're a flock of birds, and you're blown to a new island. And your relationship with the landscape has changed, therefore. Maybe the nesting sites you prefer don't exist. Uh, the seeds you like to eat doesn't grow there. You must innovate. You must adapt. Start eating a new kind of berry, nest in a new kind of place. So where does innovation come from? Innovation comes from change. But, and here's where Wallace's emphasis is different from Darwin's, in so doing, you have changed uh, your relationship with the landscape. You've changed the landscape. Uh, think of beaver dams where there were no beavers before. You've changed relationships with other denizens of that landscape. Um, Whatever was eating that berry you're eating now has a different relationship with its food source. The berry has a different relationship with the propagator of its seeds. So innovation also creates change. So it's a cycle, change to innovation to change. That's true in business as well, right? We don't exist in a geophysical landscape, uh, but in a business landscape. And change in that landscape demands that we innovate. But in so doing, we change that landscape. Kind of that's the point. <laughs> and we also change relationships with our customers and our partners and our vendors, our employees, that therefore demands that they also innovate. 
And so it's a cycle in business as well. The other lesson I want to draw from the natural world is the power of iterated change. You're looking at a seabed, but as uh, India has slammed into Central Asia, it has been uplifted to 29,000 and some feet, right? This is the top of Everest. Uh, and a little bit of scary math underneath. Um, this is the left-hand side of something called Price's equation. And I call it the most optimistic equation in the world. Um, because what it, what it says is, glossing very broadly, this. If you make a change, and it is positively correlated with success, however you measure it, and you do it again and again, and you iterate on it, you will drive towards success. You don't have to aim exactly in the right direction. You don't have to get there all in one step. You can do it bit by bit, and you'll still drive towards success. This is the wisdom of agile development. Small, iterated changes driving towards success. And the final lesson I want to draw from the natural world is what I call the lesson of the panda. Pandas are terrible at what they do. They really are. They're bears. They got bear paws and bear teeth and bear guts. And they find themselves in a forest of grass. That's what bamboo is, grass. And their paws are not very good at plucking it. And their teeth are not very good at chewing it. And their guts are not very good at digesting it. Over time, they've gotten better. They got kind of a thummy thing they've made out of wrist bones that helps them pluck it. But well, here's the thing. Imagine. Imagine that they're a bit of a fail, right? But imagine if when they first found themselves in this forest of grass, they'd become the ultimate bamboo eating machine. That would be bad news for the pandas. Because bamboo, every hundred years or so, is in a habit of blooming on mass and dying on mass. So if you make the bold leap all in one go to perfection, the world can change out from underneath you in the meantime. And it's easier to survive a small failed experiment than a large failed experiment. As a small failed experiment, they can muddle through in their bear-like ways. If they were the ultimate bamboo eating machine, they'd all be dead. Now you're thinking, you're sitting here and saying, she said she was going to talk about the data hub and search. And this is all fascinating, but what does this have to do with that? Only this. The MarkLogic Data Hub is a platform for innovation of exactly this kind I've been talking about. It is a platform for small, iterated, incremental development, driving bit by bit towards success. And search is what's driving a lot of the action within the MarkLogic Data Hub. And we can think of this cycle of innovation as, as kind of roughly like this, in three phases. There's kind of a modeling phase, right? This is, you're understanding what your next innovation step will be. You're shaping, you're figuring out how to shape your data. You're getting ready to actually bring it together. Then there's the, what I call the active curation phase. I mean, this is all curation, but the active curation phase is the, you're actually doing it. You're actually reshaping the data and harmonizing the data to bring it together for your next innovation step. And then there's a consumption phase. You're using it. You're applying that next innovation. You're seeing how well it works out to prepare yourself for the next cycle. Search is playing, I should point here. Search is playing an active role in all of these steps. Um, but before we sort of talk about how that is, um, I want to give you a more expansive view of what we mean by search. You may think of search as a noun. I'm typing some words. I'm getting results. I'm doing a search. And that is search. But I want to expand your minds a little bit about what search means. You may think of search as a verb. I'm exploring. I'm going here. I'm going there. I'm searching. And that is search. Uh, but I want to expand your minds about what search means. I want you to think about search as an adverb. 
What is the searchy way of solving my problems? What is the search perspective on problem solving? So what is the search perspective on problem solving? Search is universal. And I, I mean universal in the way the universal index in Mark Logic is universal, where the data defines the index. Right? We, we say that a lot, but I want you to pause and think about, that's really quite profound. I can stand here and invent a word that has never before been seen in the history of the world and put it in a document and put it in Mark Logic, and Mark Logic will make an index from that word for that word. That's pretty magical. So it's not just words, right? It could be phrases, values, relationships, places. These are a couple of Wallace's specimens, with Wallace's tags on them. And very unusually for his time, Wallace wrote very detailed location information on his tags. You know, the standard of the time was where do you get this specimen? Brazil, the Congo. He said which specific island and often which specific river and island. In so doing, he made it possible to ask questions relating location to form because the data defined the questions that you can ask. And in so doing, he invented a whole field of biogeography. He discovered a discontinuity in the flora and fauna of Southeast Asia and islands below that is to this day called the Wallace Line. That's the search perspective. Search is selective. Right? Um, this is not the Hadoop perspective. The Hadoop perspective is I will send forth an army of workers, open every single drawer until I get the one with the morpho butterflies and bring it back. Search says, I got an index for that. I know exactly which drawer has the morpho butterflies. I will pull it out and bring it back to you. That's not unique to search. Most databases have that perspective. But it is part of the search perspective. This is more specific to the search perspective. Search is ranked. Some matches are better than others. And you can quantify it. And you can use that quantification to rank things, to order them. Um, we often talk about this uh, in terms of natural language. Oh, natural language, it's fuzzy, it's imprecise, it's a matter of opinion. And that is all true. But it goes well beyond that. Uh, here's a query for you. Uh, get me all the guys who made a million dollar trade in the last month. That's pretty definitive. I mean, they did or they didn't. That's not. Um, but for some purposes, it might be interesting or more germane or more important, more relevant to see the guy who had $100 million trades last month over the one who only had one. That's scoring as a means of focusing attention. Um, for some purposes, it might be more important, more interesting, more relevant to see the guy who had the $200 million trade ahead of the guy who had only the $2 million trade. That's the search perspective. And finally, search is contextual. Um, you know, 40 years of the relational paradigm have trained us to forget. Business records are business documents. They're not just assemblages of atomic facts that happen to get carried around together. They tell a story. They talk about relationships between things, between you and the customer, and how the customer intends to use your product. A lot of you probably booked a hotel for this conference. Yeah? It seems like about as assemblage of fact kind of thing as you can imagine, right? There's your name, there's some payment information, the date range, what kind of room you want. But there's one more thing, comments, special requests. Um, this is where you say, my flight's coming in after midnight, please hold the room, or I need a cot, a to a cot for my toddler, 
or uh, I need a bowl of M&Ms with all the brown ones removed, right? <laughs> Whatever it is. It's your customer trying to tell you about how they're going to interact with your product. Do you think your most potent innovations are going to come from the data you've already atomized and understand completely? No. It's going to come from these annotations. And these are not annotations. These are not, this isn't a comment field. Right? These can be annotations about the record, about a specific field in the record, about assemblages of data. That's the search perspective. There's a variety of activities, search activities, we can talk about. Um, and I've drawn some key ones here kind of in a cyclical way. Well, I'll be honest. I got our graphics department to draw them in a cyclical way. I can't draw. Um, and it's fundamentally, it's, it's very cyclical in terms of its application. We'll see in a bit, right? There's, you're sort of selecting, pulling out actual data for use. Sampling and characterizing and exploring is often part of sort of preparatory uh, work. And then getting alerts, sort of off on the side a little bit. At the center of it all is curation. It's really all about curation. And, you know, these are drawn as a circle, but there's a lot of interconnections and relations. There's a lot of other kinds of activities you might think of as intersections between these, you know, between sampling and Selecting, there's hypothesizing. But we're going to focus on the main ones right now and see how the search perspective applies in there. So selection, this is your, your basic operational access, right? This is um, your locating, you know, give me the customers who, find me the order that, right? How are you locating this data? How are you selecting it? By its characteristics. What characteristics? The universal characteristics that define the questions you can ask. Or maybe you're locating them by the context, by their relationships with other pieces of data, by the narrative surrounding them. And you're getting ranked matches back. That's the search perspective. Sampling is about creating slices of data. Uh, this is often in, in sort of the modeling phase of things, part of the paradigm is you need to test what you're doing, right? Um, you're setting up a machine learning model. You need a sample so you can train it. You need a sample so you can test it. You're setting up your own smart mastering rules. You're going to need to test them. Um, so those tend to be random samples. There's also, I should say, there's samples, analytical samples, right, where you don't want to boil the ocean in trying to make an understanding of your business after the fact, you want to take slices of the data and examine them uh, in that way. So there's, you're still selecting by these universal characteristics, uh, but maybe if it's random, it's a characteristic that's sort of longitudinal across your concern. And if it's an analytical sample, it's more a germane uh, attribute. So you're still selecting by these universal characteristics. But here's the best way to do a random sample in MarkLogic. You do a search, and you score random. And you take the top however many. Now, that's not how most people think about doing a random sample. But that is the search perspective. And then characterization is understanding your samples, right? Understanding your data. It's all about grouping and comparing and clustering and looking at distributions and outliers. A lot of ranking here. And there's a central, I hate to call it a trick, but I'll call it a trick. The trick, the trick of turning metadata into data. Because the data defines the index. The data defines the question you can ask. So turn your metadata into data. Now you can ask questions about it. That's a search perspective. And exploration, exploration is all about context, right? Um, I have this guy who's married to this woman who has an account in common with a guy who just got a million bucks from a sanctioned Russian oligarch. That's all about context. That's all about exploration of that context. 
Um, and in general, exploration follows a sort of common paradigm. You're selecting a starting point based on what? Characteristics. What characteristics? The universal characteristics. Uh, and then you're navigating the relationships. That's the search perspective. And, and finally, alerting. Uh, so far, we've talked about search as something you sort of reach out and you grab something and bring it to you. Alerting is about being tapped on the shoulder, right? Getting, getting notified about something. You know, hey, there's this guy that's married to this woman that has an account in common with this guy who just got a million bucks from a sanctioned Russian oligarch. You might want to check him out, and her, and him. Um, in Mark Logic, it can be an arbitrarily complicated query using any of the Mark Logic advanced search features. Um, so, how do these? Here's, here's our cycle of innovation, of modeling, of active curation and consuming. How do these activities map onto those phases of your innovation cycle? Roughly like this, right? Modeling, we talked about this. It's about sampling, characterizing, exploring. It's about understanding your data and using search to do that. The active curation phase is mainly around selection, selecting the data to bring in. And then consuming is selection. Certainly, we said that was your main operational access. But also exploration, potentially, like this sort of sanctioned Russian oligarch case we talked about, and alerting. Let's double click on what's actually happening inside the MarkLogic data hub and see how this plays into that. So the MarkLogic data hub, it's about making curated data, right? Which it's data that's been harmonized. So data of different shapes brought into a common shape or brought into a better shape, right? It could be you only have one shape data, but harmonization is a matter of making it into a more useful shape. We'll talk about that in a minute. It's data that's been mastered. So you're bringing partial records together or eliminating duplicates or both. Uh, you're dealing with reference data. You're dealing with various kinds of enrichments uh, and keeping your provenance and lineage as you go. Let's double click on a couple of these. Smart mastering. So smart mastering, there's two main phases here, right? There's the modeling phase of smart mastering, where you're trying to figure out, characterizing candidate match, what counts as a matching record, right? And creating rules for that and testing those rules out. Now, if you're using out of the box smart mastering rules, we've already done this part. But if you're doing your own smart mastering rules, this is on you, right? You need to try out your stuff and figure out what you got. And then there's the active, sort of the doing it part. Um, and it's about, first of all, selecting candidate matches. Now, why are we just selecting candidate matches? Because we don't want to boil the ocean. We don't want to compare against every record in the universe. We want to focus our attention on the ones that might actually be relevant. And so it's the selectivity of search that's giving you that. And then we're ranking them because some matches are better than others. And we need to know, we need to quantify that and use that quantification to decide what to do. That's a search perspective. Reference data is actually a lot like mastering. Uh, and if you saw uh, Claire Augustine's talk yesterday, she was, in fact, using smart mastering for reference data. So it makes my point beautifully. If you didn't, uh, get a time machine, go back. Um, and it's really just what you do once you've found those matches, right? Are you going to bring the data in, which is more the mastering approach to things? Or are you just going to create a reference to maintain context, which is usually how reference data is handled? Either way. It's selecting, it's ranking, it's maintaining context. It's a search perspective. There's a lot of kinds of enrichments we can talk about. Uh, classifications are common. Um, you might use keywords, you might use named entity recognition, you might be linking with semantic data. And there's still this sort of two-phase aspect, right? There is the 
the sampling and characterizing and exploring to understand what your enrichment should do, to test your enrichment, to make sure it does what you think it should do. Um, and then the application phase, which is all about selection and ranking. But it's all about the bottom line. And this is really the fundamental search perspective, the fundamental way to understand how to use search. You are using the principle of universality with intent. Why? To make the data, because the data defines the index, because the data defines the question you can ask, make the data so that it can answer the questions you want answered, so that you can get the context in there for better, selective, better selectiveness and better ranking. That's the fundamental goal of all of these enrichments, is to make it so that your searches can answer the questions you want answered. Okay, let's switch gears a little bit. We've talked about what search is doing for the data hub, how search is helping you with all this curation stuff, but what does search get from the data hub? And you know, this is not just for the search nerds among you, although you know we love you. Um, this is the consumption phase of any data hub project, right? Data access is search a mark logic, period. What does search get from Data Hub? It gets curated data, right? And it's what we just talked about. Why does it want curated data? Because the data defines the index, the data defines the questions you can ask, therefore, by curating it, you are applying the principle of universality with intent to get better context, better selectiveness, better ranking, bottom line, more relevant results, which is the bottom line for all search applications. Uh, and by which I mean not only results that are more relevant, but maybe more of them. Because if you're bringing context, making context explicit, you may be getting results you wouldn't have otherwise gotten. If we sort of look at some of the specifics here, you know, I should say this first. Curation is about understanding your data and knowing what it means, knowing how to interpret it in context, knowing what you don't know. And by knowing those things, you can ask better questions and you can provide better answers. So if we look at what harmonized data is doing, Harmonization is doing a couple of things, right? So one of the things harmonization is doing for you is taking different shape data and making it the same shape. From a search perspective, what that means is instead of saying, I will look for the phone number in phone or telephone or tell or home phone or work phone, and it might be in this format or that format or the other format, no, I've harmonized them into a single shape, a single format, my search then just needs to say, find me it in telephone in this format. That means it's simpler to write your search interface. If it's simpler to write your search interface, it's easier to write your search interface. Faster to write your search interface. Easier to innovate on your search interface. And that means you get more relevant results quicker. Bottom line. What about data mastering? This is about giving you the full context. And again, it means you can make your search interfaces simpler. Because instead of having to say, look in this record, and then make sure you look in that record, and then bring them together, you could do that. But if you master them together, you can just say, look here. Look in this one place. Or you think about it from the point of view of the answers you're getting back. It's Give me the whole thing. Give me the full context of my answer so that I can understand it. Get rid of duplicates. That means your search interface doesn't have to worry about that. It means, or your customers don't have to plow through a bunch of duplicative answers. More relevant results. Here's a bit of mastering. Uh, this is one of Wallace's tags as well. And that little number in the corner uh, is a foreign key, I guess we could call it, to his notebooks. So if we were to master these, now we can ask questions about hydrocissas in trees and get a single consolidated answer. How 
about enrichments. And again, I mean, we talked about this, right? The whole point of enrichments is to apply the principle of universality with intent, is to turn metadata into data so you can ask questions about it. And so you can understand the answers you get back more fully. And so by applying these enrichments, that's what search gets out of the data hub. It gets the ability to ask these questions and to get answers that give the full context. More relevant results. Providence and lineage is about understanding what to make of the answer. How should you believe it? Is it reliable? Where did it come from? Do you trust it? Those are important answers for someone getting search results to know. They might be important parts of the question you would ask. Um, at the end of the day, again, it's about more relevant results. That's what search. <laughs> That's what search is getting out of curated data. That's what search is getting out of the data hub. There's a bit of provenance. That red stripe. Um, that says this came from Wallace's personal collection. Now, I don't know, did he keep the best stuff for himself? Maybe. But it's an important fact that someone who's actually using this data would want to know. All right, what have we learned? We've learned, I can't drink. We've seen the data hub as an innovation engine where innovation comes from change and innovation creates change. So it's an endless cycle. We've talked about the power of iterated incremental change driving towards success because it's easier to survive a small failed IT experiment than a large failed IT experiment. I won't ask who's survived a large failed IT experiment, but you know what I mean. And we've talked a lot about the search perspective, the search way of thinking, where search is universal, search is selective, search is ranked, and search is contextual, where it's all about applying the principle of universality with intent because the data defines the index. The data defines the questions you can ask. So change the data so it answers the questions you want answered. We've seen how there's various kinds of search tasks that are involved in what is happening. Sampling and characterizing and exploring, selecting and getting alerts. And these all involve any of MarkLogic's advanced search features in the data. Search drives curation, preparing for curating, the modeling phase, performing curation, the active act of shuffling data around, uh, and consuming the results. And speaking of consuming the results, it's all about we talked about this a million times, applying the principle of universality with intent to make search better. And so, go forth, be a slightly better panda. I went way fast, so we have time for questions and discussion. Oh, come on, don't be shy. Ask me anything. Oh, uh, I think we need the mic so we can hear it on the recording. Or I'll repeat it. Or are you running it over? Okay. So this is a ontology triples kind of question. Okay. Um, a lot of what you've talked about is in regards to relationships within data. Mm -hmm. So if we're looking at this in the terms of like triples with concepts and edges, mm -hmm. and we're bringing in and mastering this data, are the relationships in the data being handled as concepts or are they still being handled as edges between concepts? Um, from a triple point of view, um, they're edges. However, 
if you store them as uh, data, they're also, they're also, I, I don't want to use the word concept that's overloaded, but they're also things in themselves that can be searched upon, yeah. Okay, so if we were to look inside of how, how Mark Logic is structuring all of these concepts or whatever you want to mm -hmm. call them, are the relationships between them really boiling down to like taxonomic structures of is a kind of or is synonymous with? Or are you still actually maintaining the true edges of things that might not be predefined within Mark Logic, but could be something like uh, promotes or owns or you know different relationships that mm -hmm. aren't in that structure? Um, well, I mean, I think that's a data modeling question for your data. I would say that you know it's a sort of an irony of the relational model that the most important relations are not visible, right? And so what you're really saying is it's a relation between entities and by capturing it and making explicit, you know, what is the relationship between this thing and that thing, you know, promotes by or whatever, right? That then becomes something you can ask questions of and know about in the full context of any answer you're giving. And so I think that's the, the you know, sort of my recommendation of how should you data model. Um, Model is relations, what, you know, those big bold arrows in your ER diagram are, you know, the important relations that are semantically meaningful, right? Because that's capturing the context between entities that matters. And so that's what you should express so you can ask questions of it. Okay, thank you. Mary, since uh, search predates Data Hub, uh, what are the what are the main optimization you did to support <laughs> Data Hub service? Um, in point of fact, um, the answer is C. None of the above. Um, I think search is already very well optimized, and particularly uh, search against the universal index is the fastest thing in Mark Logic. Um, and so I think it's more where Data Hub wants to optimize itself, it leverages that. So the optimization flow goes the other way. So you should ask the Data Hub people. <laughs> uh, up in front, right here in the corner. So this is more, a little more technical question. Mm -hmm. Following the first question, the gentleman asked about ontology. So in order to leverage the traditional more like a property-based search, but also being able to query the triple, should I just you know, create a standard document and using matter like TD to extract triple, or should I explicitly generate the triple by myself? Um, you know, the answer to every engineering question is it depends. I think to the extent, personally, I think if you embed triples in your documents, then they become entities in their own right you can search. It's in some ways less convenient though, right? TDE, it just does it by magic and that's pretty sweet. You can still ask questions of them through Sparkle, right? And so this is the it depends part. What kinds of questions do you want to ask? If you want to sort of cross the streams a little bit, where you sort of have some of the semantical stuff combining with some of the more full texty stuff, sometimes it makes more sense to just have them in the document. Then they sort of live in this dual space where they're both triples and they're facts in the document that exist in the universal index. Um, but for many purposes, in fact, it sort of becomes this more like there's things you want to search for within a document and then the relationships are how you're connecting it to other information and so they don't really need to be together that way so you know that's sort of a non-answer answer but that's how it goes in engineering 
ask me anything about anything. No? All right. Well, thank you very much.